My name is Grace McDaniel. We will be continuing our series on the truth about the creation account, part five, on the topic, the manifestation of light. I would like to emphasize that the creation account is very crucial to our Christian foundation as believers. It is important that we view the creation account in Genesis 1 as a literal and historical narrative that establishes God as the uncreated creator and the uncaused first cause who created the heavens and earth in six literal and consecutive days. We cannot allow agnostics, atheists, and higher critics to tell us that the creation account is nothing more than an allegory, a fallacy, figurative speech, a legend, a myth, a parable, and or just simply poetry. The creation account as a pillar of our Christian faith is an integral part of Bible doctrine that is supported in both the Old and New Testaments. The creation account as a fundamental tenet of revelation establishes God as being self-existent, eternal, transcendent, eminent, immutable, and powerful. The creation account as a central tenet of faith conveys that God is the uncreated creator, the uncaused first cause and source of all life. And by the utterance of his words, the creation of the heavens and the earth became physical entities. Thus, the creation account provides evidence of the awesome power of God's word. The creation account also magnifies God's infinite knowledge and wisdom as a great architect, scientist, designer, artist, chemist, biologist, geologist, physicist, and anthropologist, which is captured in his role as the intelligent designer. The creation account declares beyond a shadow of doubt that God made the world and everything in it out of nothing. Lastly, the creation account presents us with logical and reasonable information that God created man and he has every right as creator and God to require that man worship him. As believers, we must recognize the gravity of the worldviews of creation and evolution. We must stand for truth that supports the word of God. We must not and cannot stand by idly and allow continuous attacks on the accuracy of the scripture, which includes the creation account, without responding. Because everyone believes in something we must boldly proclaim and demonstrate through the word of God the reality of God's existence that he is real and very much alive. We must allow God to use us to make a difference in the circular world's false world view about God and the creation account. Now let us begin our topic, the manifestation of light which focuses on Genesis 1-3, which reads, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We need to note at this juncture that God was an invisible and intangible spirit who was moving and hovering over the deep as darkness existed upon the face of the waters. In the engineering mind of God, God as the great scientist, chemist, physicist, biologist, geologist, and anthropologist knew the importance of creating light first to address the darkness. God's omniscience dictated that light would be the first business at hand because the physical world that would be forthcoming would not be able to exist without the presence of light. God knew that light would be the necessity for all life forms, which included plant life and mankind. God knew that light was needed to govern and to allow all life forms to exist on the forthcoming earth. 
God also knew that light was needed for all life forms orientation in time and space. God knew the properties that the light had to have and the functions that it would have to perform for the forthcoming sky and earth. Thus the production of light becomes God's first priority and first creative activity to address the existing darkness. In Genesis 1-3, the first three words assert, and God said. This expression introduces God's first creative activity. These words also indicate everything is done according to his sovereign decree, his will, and his command. God's words, let there be, must be regarded as a statement of his sovereign decree, which is equivalent to a universal law. When God decreed, we shall see a pattern that his words always bring about the desired results from the plan in his mind. God's words were so powerful and authoritative that instantly, immediately, not thousands of years, not billions of years, light manifested itself in the natural and physical realms that had not existed before. The power of God's words was so demonstrative that whatever God had in his mind that was part of his architectural blueprint on the first day was encapsulated in that one phrase, let there be light. His words were so precise, definite, and compressed that light sprung into existence. Thus we have on record the executive power of God's words as a spoken command to bring about the results that he expected. Through God's sovereign and divine decree, Light appeared and illuminated the face of the deep. Thus light became the product of God's word, which brought forth visible and natural light to the existing darkness. Although it is beyond our comprehension, God alone created light as a direct product of his words to illuminate gross darkness without the use of the sky, the sun, moon, and stars at this time. What a remarkable feat. As a result of God's mandate, light became visible and manifested itself. Science defines light as being a form of energy visible to the human eye that is radiated by protons, which are particles in motion, by the atoms electrons that leads to the emission or radiation of light photons. In essence, God created light that consisted of energy and matter. Matter was brought into existence when light manifested itself in obedience to God's word. All matter is light energy in its condensed state that consists of atoms. Hence, light is made up of atoms. Atoms are small matter, which is light energy in its condensed state. God created light as the first matter. Matter is everywhere and is everything. Matter is a collective bond of atoms which forms molecules, which in turn the molecules form more matter. Atoms consist of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Neutrons are in the center of each atom. Protons are in the nucleus, while the electrons orbit. According to science, the scientists have no explanation to explain why and how atoms exist. Isn't that amazing? The first dictionary also defines light as photons, which carries the electromagnetic force and is responsible for the atomic structure, chemical reactions, the attractive and repulsive forces associated with electrical charge, magnetism, and all other electromagnetic phenomena. This light that God created on the first day is both magnetism and electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic energy is made up of atoms 
which are small invisible energy over light. Light is made up of the electromagnetic spectrum that consists of every form of radiation that travels and spreads out as it goes as vibrations. According to research, where there is energy used, there is light. Henceforth, everything that God created in the sequential five days is a form of light in its raw states at the point in creation. According to quantum physics, all matter emits electromagnetic radiation which is produced whenever there are moving charges which are virtually everywhere. God performed an outstanding miracle of producing light with its many facets and components. God was the synergizer who created matter in the atoms that combined with other nuclear forces to activate the electromagnetic spectrum that was set in motion. With the understanding that light is made up of electromagnetic spectrum that consists of every form of radiation, light travels and spreads out. As light travels, it does so in the form of vibrations and has energy of higher vibration than darkness. Light has a physical substance and a supernatural aspect about it because it is made up of atoms. Every atom and every molecule have frequency or vibrational energy. Science says that atoms and molecules obeys the laws of chemistry and physics, even the laws of thermodynamics. From my multiple readings, it appears that God embedded the atoms, coded information because of this complex and intricate structure. Collectively, there are about 118 different types of atoms to my amazement. What is so fascinating and mind-boggling to me is the fact that everything that God would create in the next five days would simply be a form of light. Isn't that amazing? Varying and or differing according to frequency and vibrational energy. When we consider that the electromagnetic spectrum is the complete range of the electromagnetic waves on a continuous distribution from a very low range of frequency or vibrational energy to high levels, God created light to be comprised of the entire electromagnetic spectrum of seven wavelengths. One, the gamma rays. Two, the x-rays. Three, the ultraviolet radiation. Four, visible light. Five, infrared radiation. Six, microwaves and radio waves with seven colors. Green, red, blue, yellow, cyan, magenta, and a perfect white. Each color has a definite place in the electromagnetic spectrum. In addition to all that and more, God gave us the spectrum of light that produces seven tones on the music scale. What an awesome God. Light waves and other types of energy that radiate from where they are produced are called electromagnetic radiation, which makes up the electromagnetic spectrum. All the different kinds of electromagnetic radiation are essentially the same stuff as light, which is a form of energy. I would like to add that scientifically, light, electricity, and magnetic forces are all part of the same energy source. In other words, as we have discussed, energy is matter, and all matter has atoms and electromagnetic energy. Therefore, magnetism is a carefully designed property of matter which is not fully understood by our scientists and physicists that say that they do not fully understand the process. Although our scientists and physicists may not fully understand, we know that God designed magnetism to exist in the very fabric of matter. Therefore, when we talk about light, 
We are also talking about electricity and magnetism, which are the same thing. They are all manifestations of the same phenomenon, the electromagnetic field. The United States Department of Energy classifies light as a varying electric and magnetic field which spreads out from one place to another as particles of photons carrying energy and momentum. Classical theory confirms that light is oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Quantum mechanics tells us that no matter can exist without light and all matter exists of invisible particles. Note that, invisible particles. Only God can create invisible particles and create something from something that is not seen. So we must be cognizant that there had to be light first in the form of energy for matter to exist. It is so amazing to me that God has created light as energy. According to science, energy is everywhere and in everything. Energy changes from one form to another and from one place to another. Yet the total amount of energy always remains the same. It does not change but flows, moves, or changes if anything is to happen. Hence, light as energy is unstoppable. Therefore, God through his sovereign decrees, created laws and ordinances to govern the functioning of light and set its boundaries for the physical universe which was to come. Without the sun, without the moon, and without the stars as light givers. After such a phenomenal and supernatural creative act, Genesis 1-4 declares, that God saw that the light was good. Good in the Hebrew language means pleasant, agreeable, very pleasing and excellent. God was satisfied with the light. When God saw that the light had met his requirements, he then divided the light from darkness. God then took the existing visible light that he called into being and set it aside. He set it apart from the darkness. He called the darkness night and the light he called day. Thus God separated the light from the darkness and then he separated the night and day so that there would be two specific domains. In his infinite wisdom and knowledge, God chose to have the light and darkness separated forever from each other. God required that the night and day would be forever two separate domains. God wanted the night and day to never coexist as a unit. Henceforth, God decreed that night and day would never coincide with one another. God alone sovereignly decreed that the night and day would be totally distinctive as they serve as measures of time. We should give careful attention to the fact that after God pronounced and summarized that his creative activity was concluded, God declared that the evening and the morning was the first day. Unfortunately, we have evolutionists and Bible scholars who do not agree with how God has defined this first day. They have concluded that this time had to be long periods of time, either millions or billions of years. They also argue that there was no sunrise or sunset because the sun was not created until day four. They reason that the phrase evening and morning could not be an actual evening and morning. So the evolutionists and scientists dispute what God established. However, the phrase evening and morning is found 38 times in the Old Testament. And in every case, it means in literal and ordinary 24-hour day. 
I would like to emphasize again that we must allow the scripture to interpret scripture in context. It is also important that we understand that because words can have more than one meaning, we must look at each word for the correct meaning depending on the context. When we consider that God used the phrase evening and morning and then designated that evening and morning as the first day, we must acknowledge that God is setting a precedent in naming that time frame as an ordinary day. The word day in Hebrew is yom. Again, this word has many meanings, but when we keep it in context of the scripture, it refers to a literal 24-hour day. Dr. James Burr, who is a professor of Hebrew at Oxford University, admitted the following about Genesis 1. He states, so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer or writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideals that A, creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. B, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition of chronology from the beginning of the world up to the latter states in the biblical story about Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguish all human and animal life except for those in the ark. This is through a personal letter that he wrote to David Watson, April the 23, 1984. According to Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who is also a Hebrew scholar with a doctorate in physics from MIT, he has provided the following interesting facts about morning and night. He says, according to the ancient Hebrew sages, the word for evening era comes from a root meaning mixed up stirred together disorderly. It brings to mind the confusion we sometimes experience just at dusk, when the mix of light and darkness can cause our eyes to play tricks on us. This word recalls the clarity of vision that accompanies dawn. The law of entropy explains that when alone, everything in the universe will deteriorate from order into disorder. By using these words for evening and morning in their particular order, God reveals that in each day of creation, he was overruling the law of entropy by bringing disorder into order. This demolishes any argument that the earth came to be by accident or coincidence or that man could have evolved from animals that evolved from fish Etc. To make sure we get the point, God repeated the phrase six times and caused his people to begin their day at sunset. Therefore, in conclusion, God defines very carefully that the evening and morning was the first day. This phrase, the evening and the morning, follows God's creative activity of light signifying time. As we shall see, as we examine closely each verse in Genesis 1, after each creative act that God performs, evening and morning is established as the day. Thus, the evening cannot be the beginning of the day. Evening should be viewed as the concluding of the day as morning signal the transition. The scripture tells us that evening and morning was the first day. The scripture and most of Genesis 1 is very con controversial and much debated. But to make a long story short, although the Hebrew word of day is yom and has a variety of meanings, it is important that we look at what the day means in this context. The question is, what does it mean here? As always, we must keep in mind that words have many meanings, and
and we must let scriptural context take precedence in defining the meaning and the passage of the scripture. At all times, the context of the scripture must be considered. Evolutionists and other Bible scholars contend that the creation account took place thousands and billions of years, which represents long periods of time. But this is not what God is saying in this verse. On this occasion, God declared that evening and morning was the first day. What God has stated and defined is a limited and definite period of time, which would be in the Hebrew language as a literal 24-hour day. Notice that God meticulously and specifically defined the word day within the context of Genesis 1 with four other qualifiers to make sure that there would be no doubt to how he was defining the word day. With the knowledge that Genesis was written to the nation of Israel, they understood the terminology that God was using and understood why each new day started at sunset and not sunrise. Henceforth, we know that the first day was finished and completed as God intended it to be. It is noteworthy to understand that in Jeremiah 33, verses 20 through 26, God had established a covenant with day and night. Jeremiah 33, verses 20 through 26 say the following. Thus saith the Lord, if ye break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven, cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured. So I will multiply the offspring of David my servant and the Le Levitical priesthood who ministered to me. This covenant began at creation as a fixed law as to how day would be defined as a literal 24-hour day forever maintained by God. Please note that on the first day when God created light, there was no heaven and no sky, yet the light existed among the waters. God had miraculously produced light without the heavens, sky, sun, moon, and stars. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you next time.